Mm-hmm. And so maybe talk a little bit about what's the what's that dynamic like of uh, the writer director being uh, your husband. What's that kind of situation, working situation like? Well, first of all, as an actor, my favorite director to work with is a writer director. I mean, whether it's Gus Van Zandt or Mitch, I you know, or other people I've worked with, I really like to be able to pick their brain and 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 the fact that they see the entire world, the backstory, the future, you know. And um and also Mitch is such a lovely and romantic person in a very cynical and uh kind of ugly time we're living through. Um you know, he's he's incredibly intelligent and very successful and um you know, his uh his group of of kind of close and dear friends would be shocking for most people to hear. I mean, they're really the the best and the brightest. Um and uh and they all love him and he, because he is so dear and sweet. Uh, you know the the sort of inspiration of this movie came after he had you know had a, a kind of his f- fun and young years with people like John Belushi who was one of his best friends and all sorts of running around and and you know having a good time and he met me about 20 years ago both of us feeling like we'd never fall in, would would it really ever fall in love permanently and that kind of thing like it was a sort of fairy tale. And um, our relationship has completely changed both of our lives in the way that, um, you know, we I guess we met our match, and we, we both sort of feel we redeemed the other, that we, we could have, I could have ended up in a sort of more all-alone Sharon Stone mode. I turned down a lot of movies she did, mainly because <laughs> I was married with Mitch and I had a child, and why would I want to sort of subject myself to that those sorts of characters when I could do like Drugstore Cowboy and these independent films that I've, I love and I can be an actor, you know. And, you know, and he was saved from sort of the, you know, the life of a bachelor in Hollywood, which is another thing, too. And we have together have done just incredible things. Um, one of the things we did early on was uh, I was doing a really sweet movie um, called Three of Hearts. The director sort of had a nervous breakdown, and Mitch was hired to do some rewrites, and then the producers kind of sort of, hijacked him into directing which he had never directed before and they're really the most wonderful scenes in that movie and we were all like you've got you must direct you know and he really didn't have the bug um he he loves writing you know and he loves the collaborative process of filmmaking but um he always had the in his back pocket uh um passion play is something that we that actually we were going to do together and and he wrote the part of lily for me um the angel. Um, my angel was a little bit more earthbound um, and a little bit more Veronica Lake and a little less probably Ava Gardner or Hedy Lamar, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> um, and uh, and Mickey and Mitch went to high school together. Um, M- Mitch's mother was their teacher in Miami at Beach High. She actually showed Mickey a place in the sun, and it was the the, the moment that Mickey decided to be an actor, he saw Montgomery Clift and thought, I get that what this guy is and what he's doing, and I love this, and I want to do this. And he's credited Mrs. Glazer in many interviews and so forth. And and um, the first take of, the, of, the, of Passion Play, Mickey looked at Mitch and said, this one's from Mrs. Glazer. You know, it was very <laughs> sweet. And um, it was kind of like our own dream, you know, the the people we know and love very well are in this movie, um, you know, he wrote the part of Harriet for Angelica Houston, who's one of our closest friends, and, and, and I slid into that part of Harriet at my age now, and, of course, Megan Fox, Mitch had never seen any of Megan's work, and someone suggested her, and he said, sure, I'll meet her, and um, he sat, sat across the table from this young 23-year-old girl with all the paparazzi outside the window, and her her true and lovely way um and and thought this is lily i mean this is a girl who's been with the same boy for 6 years they're happily married she sits at home when they watch tv and she cooks and they have a little boy that uh um her husband has custody of she's as as far away from the megan fox that people portray in blogs and the press as anyone i've ever met she's wow. really a, a lovely and gentle and tender person you know, um, who was who who quit Transformers? Um, right. Who was not fired? And there's so many things that are untrue about her. You know that, and I feel sad that if 
if people had discovered her in this movie and had she had not the baggage of of her, you know, I can relate because I was a very sexy, beautiful young woman in my twenties. I think, thank God, there there wasn't these awful blogs because I would have never had the chance to do a drugstore cowboy. You know, I I stepped in for Annette Benning in Roadhouse who was fired, and I was under contract with United Artists. I had no choice. I did this movie. Of course, it's it's beloved in its own kind of cheesy way, but it would have been it would have killed me. That would have been it. They would have said, you know, what is she? She's a doctor, but she's you know has white hair and she's in a mini dress. And what kind of world is this? And you know, it's the drive-in movie or whatever. But um, sure. and no harm intended. You know, actors are. It's a collaborative art form. Um, but but I do think she is so lovely in this movie and she is so who she is in this movie um and uh you know i hope that people can get beyond their whatever it is their jealousy or their you know um problems both mickey and mit and uh, mitch and also bill murray just thought she was fantastic i mean absolutely fantastic and i can tell you that mickey pretty much thinks everybody can act and isn't any good and you know this is my second movie with him and we're very close but he he's very hard on most actors mainly because he's a highly trained actor and he thinks people are lazy you know well, and that, that that brings me to a question you, you you brought up a lot of things which you I can get to and that this was kind of a reunion for for you and mickey rourke you you all did uh, 20 years ago you all were in a movie called uh desperate hours uh, right hopkins and directed by michael camino yeah. Um, so and it was and you and Mickey Rourke. So I'm sure that was a very high pressure kind of set. And so I'm wondering, you know, and since you've been friends with Mickey for all these years, what can you tell us of the change in him now that he's had this wonderful comeback? I always feel like the other shoe will drop with Mickey because you know he is a unique and vulnerable talent. You know, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I appreciated Mitch seeing him as a leading man as opposed to really his comeback has been a, a, a significant amount of the same character, which I call the fighting machine, mm-hmm. whether it's Sin City, The Wrestler, you know, I mean, you name it, any movie that, I mean, yeah, it's Iron Man, it, he's a he's a fighter, he's a killer, he, he, he you know, he's hitting people, he's on steroids or whatever he does to make himself look like that. And I quite honestly fell in love with the Mickey Rourke, you know, the early Mickey Rourke, the Mickey Rourke that was an actor, that was, um, you know, a person, that was a leading man. Yeah, diner. Diner. Yeah, I mean, Pope of Greenwich Village, diner. I mean, these movies just, even his cameo in Body Heat, which is, he absolutely steals the show. You see her looking at him like, oh, my God, you know, who is this kid? And he has a tremendous gift, Mickey. I mean, it's it is staggering, and uh, and I and I was so happy that Mitch allowed him this trip back into being the man who gets the girl, because mm-hmm. he's just the big thug who gets to beat somebody up, right? You know, and and that's it. I mean, and I and I'm always wondering why Hollywood doesn't see it this way. Mm-hmm. You know, they just have they've shoved him in that place, and they are keeping him there. And as long as he does that, it's fine. But God help him if he tries to, you know, to spread his wings. Pardon the expression a little bit, because it's, it makes people uncomfortable. You know, he's a he's a very vulnerable actor, and when when he's allowed to show that vulnerability, I think it's very it makes it makes people feel something, and that's a in you know that's the the job of an actor. But people are not always uh, comfortable with that. And the thing about Passion Play, obviously this is a very personal family uh, project. So I'm wondering mm-hmm. what you can talk about. What what if what was gained or maybe you had to become a little more protective or just roll with it with the, the kind of wild reception the film initially got uh, at, at Toronto? Yeah, well, the film was unfinished. <clears throat> you know, um, there were producers who wanted the film to go there. Uh, you know, the market has been really, really bad, you know, of, I don't know, 130 films that were there, 20 were picked up. You know, it's really bad. I mean, the, is the business of Hollywood is something that the public doesn't really understand anymore. There are very, very few places to show movies anymore because uh, the way dis- distribution is set up where you have really, like, slots for movies like Avatar and no slots for beautiful independent films. So 
whatever you can do to get it out there, I guess, is, was the idea. But, you know, I thought it was too early for the film. Um, there were a lot, a lot of things that were unfinished about it. The film, the film, the final film was, was edited. Um, music was scored at Abbey Road um, with Dick and Hinchliffe, who, who did a, just a tremendously beautiful score. Um, and uh, you know, effects were, were changed, and th- it was not finished. You know, right. But uh, again, I think um, you know, we if if people have a go in with a certain mindset they see a different movie than other people and there's kind of like I see the movie like sort of like like a beautiful Frankenstein you know that and all the townsfolk with their pitchforks after it and uh, I talked to Warren Beatty who's a friend of mine and he said it was a similar reaction after Bonnie and Clyde at Toronto that they hated it I mean right. I said you're kidding I mean 12 Academy Award nominations later he said no you don't understand it was a joke I couldn't show my face they were it was you know, he said again, if there was an internet to have killed it, um, you know, we we would be dead. And um, you know, it's, it is it's you know, you've got a, a bunch of people who who have their own reasons to like or not like something too. I don't know. I can't speak for all of that, but we we all love it, you know, and we love making it, and we think it's beautiful, and we're we're to, we're just gonna let it be as it is, and let time decide what they really think about this movie. You know, speaking about Toronto, and I, I'm reminded going back, because I, I was around a little, I, I, I remember the uh, that that fall of 89 with Drugstore Cowboy. And yeah. I'm curious of, of you as an actor, because, and you, had mixed, you, you hinted at this a little bit earlier, in that, you know, May of 89, Roadhouse came out, and it was this big mm-hmm. kind of, you know, this summer B movie that was a lot of fun, and then... Yeah. Four months later, Drugstore Cowboy comes out, and you got to show a totally different side of you uh, as right. an actor. And, and I'm curious, at that moment, what you felt you you should be doing as an actor, because you right there you did both kinds of films that Hollywood has to offer. And and I was wondering how you felt, you know, because certain actors do have to kind of straddle that line. First of all, it's a lovely thing to think about that an actor has the choice that they that, that people think you might have. I did. Drugstore Cowboys, the movie I went after and I fought for, and I was the first actor that Gus saw, and he he hired me on the spot against the feelings of everybody in the room probably because he had a bunch of other actors to see, and he was like, no, you're the one I want. Um, uh, Roadhouse was a movie that Annette Bening had been had, was doing, and she was fired, and I was under contract to the United Artists, so I didn't have a choice about doing Roadhouse. I did it, and I knew what it was. And and uh, Joel Silver, the producer, said, "This is like a like a glorified drive-in movie. And it'll play forever. People will love this movie." And it was like, "Oh my God, I couldn't," you know. And at that point, you know, I, I you know, I was I was obviously wanting to be an actor, not wanting to, you know, I'd been a model and I'd done a lot of things like this and cocktail and these t- types of movies. So Drugstore Cowboy was my way out of you know, that place that a pretty girl will find, like, you know, uh, will find herself trapped in. Um, We we don't live in the elegant time of movies like in the 40s where they wanted beautiful movie stars. You know, we we live in the time where if you're Megan Fox, they're going to give you a hard time, you know, for that beauty. So it was very, very hard for me, but I continued to find my way w- with independent films, you know, and, and also television. I mean, I did a part in The L Word where I play a guy, a man named Ivan, basically a transgendered woman who looks like Willie DeVille. You know, <laughs> I've always, I mean, I always say if my, if my characters got into like, a, you know, like a plane together or a doctor's waiting room, they'd be completely freaked out about each other. So I have, I feel like I have really been fortunate in, turning a lot of stuff down that would have allowed me huge superstardom. And I've been able to spend my way as an actor, including my my role of Harriet in Passion Play. I just absolutely adored her, you know. felt she was a very real person and very grounded and funny and a big heart and obviously in love with Nate. And there was probably something in the background with the two of them. But, you know, there she is, a gal. Um, and... You know, we you you try. I, when I talk to young actors, I say, "Here's the thing: it's talent and ambition and luck. And luck is the most important thing in an actor's career." You know, I was lucky to be the second choice for for Pulp Fiction, but I wasn't the first choice. 
You know what I'm saying? There's a career that happens that you have nothing to do with. 